Hey, we came down here to Fisherman Magazine to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm here with Fisherman Electronics and Boating Editor, John Raguso. We joined Jose Martinez at the NLBN headquarters. We got the tour of the place, super exciting stuff. We're gonna deep dive into it. We got a lot to talk about today. Uh, it's my understanding that some of these very interesting lures have made their way up north over the last year or two. Not to the Long Island guys, but maybe to some of the Jersey guys. Yep. Uh, and it, apparently it's having a high degree of success. Yes. And uh, this looks like a, a very natural sand dual color, a little silver on the bottom, a little olive on the top. And But that's my understanding too that this white one yes. has been the color to use. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. So we came out with the BKK 4X Tuna Series hook. Um, is that an 8090? What is that? This is a 90 hook. Um, That's a beast of a hook. It is. It's a solid forged hook. There is no opening. This is pretty much a, I hate to say, unlimited tackle because you know the guy's going to put it on the conventional and put the put the brakes to it. But there have been guys catching fish on 50 wides, you know, on this hook. How big? 100 inch? So the guys with the 50 wides, those are Louisiana boys for the okay. yellowfin. Uh, they were catching 200 plus pound yellowfin with it. Um, on spin gear, I've heard of the guys up in the Northeast catching 100 inchers. Wow. We don't know what the weight is uh, on them. But this 4X hook is something that was asked for, not only by the tuna guys, believe it or not, a lot of the shorebound tarpon guys here in Florida needed something a little bit stronger. When you're on the boat, you could get away with this all day long. True. Our 2X hook, our 9O hook right here. On a boat, you really never need to put more pressure on a well, tarpon. Well, when you're on the shore, you gotta put the screws to them once in a while. Oh yeah. You know? Uh, not once I in a while, a lot of times. Well, even striped bass fishing, you know, some people even underestimate striped bass. 100%. When I got a light wire hook and current, heavy current, you're gonna bend that hook out. I have bent hooks out that you think, oh, this hook will be fine, you know, it's striped bass. These? These these? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm saying just like in general, like regular hooks. Sure. I'm, but I'm saying like, I would use something like this for striped bass too. Yeah. Because in situations where a wider wire hook and heavy current for striped bass, you know, you fish a Cape Cod canal. Yeah. What's a run? Five knots there. So what? You know, crazy. It's like yeah. you hook a 30, 40 pound fish. He gets the right leverage. You hook him the wrong way. You're gonna bend out a, a light wire hook. That hook also translates over to striped bass fishing too, yeah. which is almost Absolutely. guys would be like, oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. But no, it's really not crazy because I bent out hooks on Especially fishing. too, I think, Matt, you make a good point because with the, the newer reels, like for example, the the Pen Battle DXs, you can get 25 pounds of drag. The Slammers, you can get 40. You know, the Stellars, you can get 50, 55 pounds of drag. In combination with Braid, forget about it. Yeah, There's so, no gift. So now you can yep. really, you know, put the wood, you know, to, to something like that. So when you get, you know, a 30 pound fish, being pushed by a five knot current mm -hmm. and everything is wrong, like you just said, you could bend that hook out pretty easily. <laughs> so I see certainly uh, an application for the, the 4X hook for tuna fishing, but I see an application for this uh, this 2X hook for striper fishing, no doubt about it. Yeah, and believe it or not, I've had just as many requests from crazy striper guys as I have from tarpon guys I for this it. 4X hook. Yeah, like, because, or, I mean, again, you. The, the, the two tuna are pulling the boat, so it gives a little leeway, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Striped bass, it's just, I think it's it's kind of hard to like imagine because it's a 30, 40 pound striper versus a much larger tuna. But in reality, you're, you're dealing with different a different scenario. Exactly. It's totally different, it's totally unique. Well, exactly. sure, because on land you can't move. You can't move right. like you can move on a boat. And then what, impl what uh, magnification factors is a five knot current? Work on the fish Plus that could be four to stop inches a long. Fish before he hits that bridge piling. Right, yeah. exactly. Because in, or that know, ledge. in the open ocean, or that, that tuna can run anywhere, really, for the most part. The rocks, the boulders, the bridges, you got to stop them. And, you know, maybe a couple extra cranks on the drag. I know people say don't touch the drag while you find the fish, but sometimes, you have sometimes to. I have, oh, and yeah. sometimes it come off of it a little bit, and it saved me. Because yep. there are times where even I've been fishing on an inlet, and you get that, you know, the waves come up and down. Yep. As I, you know, and it's just like, I don't, it's almost not even related, but, you know, it's just a fishing tip, but sure. you get the fish coming closer to the rocks, and there's been times where I said, oh, well, if that wave pulls that fish back out, and I don't come off this drag, it's not going to, you know, it's going to snap, and I'll just come off it as I get it close, 
Yep. And you know that wave would come up and then it would pull down zzz, with the drag goes back out again. Absolutely. And it saved me from losing that fish. It's all the weight of the fish and yeah, everything. So. Um, but yeah, I have I have a handful of crazy northeast guys, which I love. And those guys are always pushing all the tackle to the limit. They're pushing their spots to a limit. And one of the things I've had guys that have told me, this hook is gonna work in 99% of situations. But when you're fishing, let's say, a boulder field and you're catching striped bass on the backside of a rock oh, boulder yeah. and you have to put the heat on it. These guys are sometimes fishing 65 braid, 80 braid, locked down and they have to make that fish come up or they can't get it. And there's been, you know, striped bass, one of the cool things about seeing them is they have they have soft mouths, but they also have hard insides of the mouth. And when they start rolling or whatnot, they can tweak hooks, just like a redfish can, just like a tarpon can when they're jumping. So I've seen them where they could tweak a hook. This hook right here, there is no tweaking there. What's interesting about this, and now this is a three ounce head, is that correct? Yep. And what are the range of uh, 4X hook size heads that you guys offer right now? We make it from three quarter to three ounce. And okay. we're working right now on a four and a five ounce as we speak. Those are gonna be interesting. Uh, three ounce is nice, but when you get some water that's moving a little bit and you're just a little bit deeper, uh, it's not so much that the jig won't get down there eventually, but sometimes you need to get it down quicker, Yeah. you know, sooner than later. And the four ounce and the five ounce heads will do that. Uh, I've used some competitive products I won't mention the other guys' names, but you could imagine who they are, where they do make a, a, a five ounce uh, or a six or an eight ounce jig head, and, and they seem to work. Now, one of the things we had talked before off camera was the shape of this head. Yes. So, uh, once again, the stuff that I've used last year and historically has more of a, like a deep V, a tapered, you know, sharp, pointy snout. And there's two or three companies that I could, you know, think of that make a jig head like that. Now this is specifically not like that. Tell us why that, that this thing could work uh, better than some of the others. I, I hate to use the word better. I like to be honest. There's a time more and a place for more There's a time and a place for everything, right? And this head was designed to be fish, uh, and I'll be honest with you, specifically in inlets on rocky bottoms, fishing the bottom, you know, our snook and tarpon fishing, primarily our snook fishing relies on you keeping that bait stuck on the bottom. And one of the things that we found is with a more pointy type head, mm -hmm. you have a lot better chance of actually lodging that jig head into a rock. Where when you have the blunt head that has a little bit of a taper going we'll upwards, up, we'll go. you can, you can bounce this off of the rocks Perfect. and get snagged up a lot less. And like you were saying, you want to be in the strike zone. You want to be where the fish are, you know, nine times out of 10, when we're out there fishing, it's the guy that's in the strike zone for the longest, the guy that's not getting snagged. That is, you know, fishing that bait where it needs to be. Typically that guy is going to have most opportunities, the most amount of bites, the most amount of fish because his bait is in the strike zone a lot right. longer. So, this head still gets down there really well. Um, it has a blunter shape to it, and it has that blunt front where you're not gonna get it lodged into the rocks. It tracks very, very true in current, so it doesn't get wobbly on you. And all the baits are really designed to be fish in heavy current where they don't have a lot of body roll. And when I say body roll, it's that side to side action. Right. And I don't wanna give away all the secrets. It's more of, more of a natural presentation that and the side to side action where it could be good in some more stagnant water if that jig head gets too far sideways it wants to come up so if it has too much body roll side to side and you're fishing it in heavy current situations once it gets too sideways a lot of times it'll come up whereas this is going to track true and straight so it doesn't have the pointy head to get down as fast as the others, but once you're down there, you're gonna hold bottom no, a lot I've, better. I've noticed too, we've talked about this before, is that the pointy heads have a tendency to dart uh, one way or another. What were you saying before about how lazy those big tuna are? Yes, and I'm not gonna act like I'm a tuna fisherman. I get this from the guys that I've spoken to out in Jersey, so I give them all the credit. It's just the time that I've spent following up with the guys, 
and seeing why, what is it about this that they're catching more fish on? For, so from what I'm hearing about the guys is that this has a lot more of a subtle side to side action when you're ripping it. It doesn't overpower the bait where it goes too far left and right where that tuna feels like it has to work too much to get to that bait. Sure. Because you're talking about two, three, four, five hundred pound fish chasing an eight inch bait. How much energy does it want to expend right. to actually And they catch know that they've bait. got that built in formula that if they yes. work too hard to get too little to gain, they're just gonna swing away. hundred percent. hundred percent. If if you're gonna work if you're gonna make it work too hard, if it has to expend out too much energy you know, a lot of times it's going to go for the a little bit slower bait on the side. What are some of the ways that your guys in Jersey are reporting back as to how they're fishing this? I mean, I fish these all the time myself, and you know, obviously you could speed jig them, you could just sort of twitch them along in a certain water level, you could uh, flip them off the bottom, you know, 10 feet like they're trying to get out of the sand and floating back down, you could speed jig them. What are some of the ways that uh, your Jersey charter boat guys are having the best success with this tour on tuna. So when the hook was coming out, I wanted to get it over to them when those big ghost fish were coming down the beach. So from what they're telling me, a lot of a lot of the times they're looking for the birds, you know, trying to cast that fish that are breaching off of the surface. So they're right. running and gunning a lot of times and trying to get the farthest cast that they possibly can to get this lure in front of their face. And a lot of times they're burning it. I did catch, you know, a group of guys that went out earlier on in the season where they were able to drop these down 100, 200, 300 feet deep and kind of, you know, they're alongside vertical jigging and they just had a really good day. They were catching them on anything, but they were bouncing these off the bottom, sticking them in the rod holder, letting the rod holder do the work, yep. you know, with the boat going side to side. But 95% of the reports that I got are they were chasing those big bluefin that were cruising down the beach, you know. They were, they were moving really fast and they just had to keep up with the birds, get the bait in front of them and get that fish to commit. So a lot of it was a lot of sight casting and burning on top. Now, the guys were catching them on the, on the three ounce, the two ounce and even the ounce and a half heads. The three ounce got them a lot of that distance when it was really sloppy out there and it was blowing. They really needed that extra right. 10 yards would make the difference. That's where that three ounce and highly requested from them is the four and the five, which we're right. working on now. We're gonna make something that you could cast, you could still fish, you could fish the bottom, but we'll still be able to get a good, you know, cast out. Well, the fours fish. and fives are gonna translate over to like that Cape Cod Canal, that inland fishing, because I can't tell you how many times yes. I've needed a four or a five to fish that kind of water, especially on a moon tide. Yep. And it's ripping. Absolutely. You need the four, and even the five especially, to get down. So Absolutely. for those striper guys who, use your stuff like these paddle tails or these straight tails yeah and they want to get a little bit more that's perfect for them it's same thing when you're casting matt uh is sometimes you need that extra weight you know three ounces nice but you got a 20 knot wind in your face you know with an east wind and you're trying to get it cut cut through there Absolutely. okay to try to get it out to where you think the fish are you need something that has a little bit more distance now we had we we're talking before about what you have done with the profile bodies of your lures to prevent them from helicoptering and getting them to sort of go sideways and cut through that wind. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so there's, um, all of these still come off of our hand port molds. Um, there's a slight modification that we're making on the eight inch. It's a big recommendation from the Northeast guys that we're getting. We're slimmering, we're slimming out, um, essentially the profile of the eight inch straight tail, we're slimming out the back half just a little tiny bit it gives it a little bit more aerodynamics when you're casting it into the wind. A little bit more tail action, but primarily it's for the castability. Right. Um, it's really hard to tell from the naked eye seeing the difference between our standard one and the slim down version. But, you know, due to the recommendations that we're getting from the guys really casting into the wind, we did taper down the back half just a little bit. That's something that's gonna be available this spring. It doesn't matter that much when you're fishing from a boat. Uh, because you know the boat can move around and there's different things that you can do to cut down on the wind and the effect of the water. But well, we'll cut the column quicker too with right. a little bit less material. But when you're on, on the beach, there's no substitute for being able to get that extra 10 or 15 yards to try to reach out. You could always go lighter braid, but then you're sacrificing that also. Yeah. yeah. As far as keeping you know the braid the same and getting that you know that swim profile, yeah, it will benefit in that. 
in that fact. And, and I do still feel one of the biggest benefits of our baits, one of the things that a lot of people overlook is you're getting the profile at the end of the day. So, I mean, you just gotta imagine nine times out of 10 that fish is looking from down up at the end of the day. So that profile really tells that fish what's you know how healthy that bait is how big it is so it is interesting you say that because a lot of the guys that i know fish your stuff back home they they say like you know especially the bigger stuff like that profile is like insane like you know the profile the profile that's what it's, it is it's, there's nothing else like it yeah you know? and, and that just looks bait, right that's it they love that an eight inch bait is not just an eight inch bait you get something that's very very thin and when that fish is looking from down up looking at it it's half the thickness of let's say one of our baits so when they're trying to pick what meal they're going to expend their energy out to go get, they're going to pick that fatter profile bait, you know, most of the time. They, they want to go up there to feed once. They don't want to go up there to feed twice. They're More going to pick calories, that less bait. effort. Well, one of the cool things also about having that bigger profile bait is that the plastic itself is heavier. Yes. So in some scenarios, you don't have to go with the heavy head to get you know to cast it you got the, the natural weight of the bait itself you can go with a half ounce or three quarters ounce head yep. you're fishing higher in the column you're still gonna get that casting distance it may not go down as deep but you're still gonna you are gonna get the casting distance because of the weight of the plastic yeah but you know you could still use a smaller head if you want to keep it up higher too so it does have that benefit as well a thousand percent and there's a buoyancy to it as well like exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. to add to that there's a buoyancy to having a little bit of a thicker profile that bait isn't going to cut through the water as as quick which sometimes is a good thing when you're fishing current and you want that bait to present itself as naturally as possible sometimes too thin of a bait you know you're just cutting the water way too too quickly it doesn't have any action uh, against the water resistance exactly right? and one of the nice things is that every single bait that we made and every single jig head that we make is made for this specific type of bait so the action that you're going to get, the fall that you're going to get with it, the way that it presents itself is current in current. It's made for this thickness of bait. So I do see a lot of people, and you can, you could take this head, you could fish it with anything, but is it going to swim the same? If you take this head and you put it on a very narrow straight tail, that body is not going to have that much resistance at all. So you're not, it'll still fish fine, but it's not going to fish the same way as with this wider body yeah. straight tail it's it's just not so there's a there's like a recipe to it to a certain respect and a lot of people look at it like fishing in current just get your bait to the bottom there's a way that you present that bait as natural as possible to make it look like the fish that are flushing through in the area that makes the difference between getting the bites or not. and this is one of the benefits of a fishing guy making a bait as right. opposed to yeah, yeah. some kid in, in, in a room somewhere pouring molds and saying yeah it's gonna work so we do yes. you mentioned the head and yep. you know of course you know you look at the design of it it's it's unique in itself yeah it's got the screw the screw uh, lock design and that I get being a surf guy uh, for years <laughs> I've always carried super glue with me especially when fishing soft plastic tails because you had to story because story of our lives every two fish the thing was getting ripped down and you had to go and you took it over your fingers yeah. you know it's, it's a mess or even worse after a couple casts a couple casts even without even a fish in every current just ripping it off yeah you know, or a, a heavy of... bait when you have a, a, a two ounce bait right. that's putting all that pressure against that collar you know it just flinging it you have the 11 Correct. 12 foot surf rods and it's a lot it it's a lot of would... moving parts going on and so you guys designed something that keeps the bait on you don't have to worry about putting glue on it that mess you know yep. all that all that you know stuff that's just annoying that we all used to deal with <laughs> still deal with it to a degree but not as much now because you guys have this design yes um you want to do a quick to i want to say a quick tutorial on how you guys actually sure put it on is that if that's cool absolutely all right so now i'm going to show you guys how to rig the nlbn with the screw lock head um it's very simple I like to first and foremost, I like to look at the jig head. So if you notice, not every single bait, the shank of the hook goes down the center. This one's a little bit higher up. And what I always like to do is I like to superimpose the head on the bait so I could see where that shank of the hook is supposed to be going. And I like to kind of use the lettering on the NLBN as a guide as to where I want to be rigging this in. So I see I kind of want to be making entry 
right along the bottom of that NLBN. And two things. I like to mark where that hook is coming out of. So right there, that hook should be coming out of right here. Put a little hole there. And then if you see, it's coming into a little bit of the top side of the bait. So I want to start here. Very important that you go straight down the middle. So like you're rigging a bass worm. You want to go straight in. You don't want it to go up or down. I like to keep that jig head right alongside the bait so you know you're threading it properly. And you want to make sure you're pushing evenly on both sides so it's going right down the center of the bait. And remember, I got my little mark there so I know exactly where I want to bring that tip of the hook out through. So you see here, right before that hook goes out, I went a little too far. So you could back it out and you could get it to come out right bullseye, right where you made that hook. So it's nice that I kind of made that mistake because it shows right before you bring that hook point out, you could see exactly where you're going with it. And you're gonna end up here. This is exactly where you wanna be at. Um, a couple different ways of rigging it. I like to use my pointer finger, my index finger, as a pusher. So as you're turning the body, I like to bring this down and around the bottom of the shank of the hook. So as you're using your index finger, you're using it to come up and under, and you're pushing that tail body of the bait up and under. that barb of the hook. So you're getting it and you're twisting it till that body just mashes right up with the head. Once you get it here, you could give it a little snug push just to make sure it's in there and kind of review it to make sure it's dead center. You know, if there's any kind of adjustments, you can kind of just play around with it. But once you have it in, you're pretty much good. You have it locked and loaded. And that bait, before it ever comes off of the shank of the hook or anything, you're going to have to rip this bait in half before. So that's just a quick little rigging tip with NLBN. You always line it up alongside of the bait so you see where that should be coming out of. And you have a perfectly rigged NLBN bait. Now that we've seen how to put the, uh, the tail on the head, so to speak, All right. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one is, what I've noticed, especially with these uh, large sandy old paddle tails, is the color blending is exceptional. How do you guys do that? Yes, so all of these baits are hand poured one at a time. Um, we started off hand pouring all our baits. For the first two years of the company, my partner Brandon and I hand poured every single bait that you see here. We hand casted every single jig head, hand painted everything. and we kept that when we went to manufacturing. Everything done the same exact wow. way. So even the machinery that my partner custom made to make these, and when I say machinery, they're still hand poured because it's, you know, it's essentially a system where it just makes it easy to hand pour. And that machinery, we duplicated it and took those duplicates to our manufacturer and actually taught them how to hand pour baits. And one of the biggest things that you get with that is exactly what you mentioned, is that color blend. Um, it's just something next to impossible to get That's on an actual natural. machine. That's yeah. But when, when you look at most laminates, which is putting the two colors together, you'll get a very hard line across. And, you know, I've never seen a bait fish. I've never seen a chartreuse bait fish either, but I've never right. seen a bait fish with that solid line that goes across. Um, so you do get a lot more of a natural blend when you do hand pour it and there's a system and a little technique to it when you sure. do pour the bait um, but that gives you a very natural blending of the two colors together um, and that's something that you just get from hand poured and it's very difficult to and get And this sandio machine. color here is like fantastic. I, I can't see how any tuna in his right mind would pass this up. That's my favorite all-around color. I have a lot of confidence in that. We call it the green back, and whether it's dirty water, clear water, you need a natural presentation. You know, I could just, 
I could gravitate to that greenback color and fish it in almost any situation and have a lot of confidence. It's almost like a, a blend of olive and gold uh, yep. with a silvery, uh, even though a lot of folks have success with their big sand eel jigs with a, a white pearlescent white color like this, uh, this is actually what the fish look like most of the time when yeah. you're bringing them up. And, uh, and even with our solid white, we went with a um, gold hue to it. Yes. So it is a, it's a white pearl, but it also has a gold pearl embedded in there as well. So you do Just have for a reflectivity. a slight gold shine to it. You know, you could almost say that it's a yellowish shine, but it, it does have like a natural dirty water type of white bait. Um, and that's something that we just gravitate to a lot of times are those gold highlights in there. Something that we did with our Hell Yeah Butter, which is our standard white. And um, yeah, that's that gives it that kind of a, like a little bit of a gold reflective finish in there. And any sort of natural scaled look that reflects light is always going to be a plus, I'm thinking, on something like this. Uh, I've noticed that on, this is the three ounce uh, Sandale jig head that uh, is your largest to date. I know you're working on a four ounce and a five ounce. Uh, I've noticed that with this uh, BKK hook, it's a solid connection from the bend of the hook into the jig head and w with the hook coming out of the, the top of the jig head right there. Uh, this 4X hook, uh, tell me why you went with a solid connection as opposed to one maybe with a swivel uh, either here or a swivel underneath. So I'm not going to lend my. I'm, I'm not going to act like I know everything about tuna fishing. Far from it, you know. And I take a lot of what we're learning from tuna fishing from the guys that we're giving it to and getting the feedback from them. One of the things that I personally, especially when it comes to big tarpon, right? Yep. Big tarpon, probably one of the closest things to a giant tuna, a 200-pound tarpon that's thrashing running hundreds of yards, taking you through bridges, through the inlets. You know, it's it's a prehistoric fish yeah. with, with armored plating on it. And one of the things is they are known to break just about any kind of tackle that you may have. So one of the things that we wanted to do is eliminate fail points in the exact, in, in the entire rig. This hook is a solid one piece hook that goes into the eye. So- 4X too. Absolutely, but you have you have zero fail points in here for the exception of this hook bending out Which I've never heard of yet. Right. You don't have to worry about a swivel You don't have to worry about another connection piece where the where the hook is connecting into the jig head or any kind of Eyelid put into the jig head that might weaken the integrity. That's a valid point I mean, it's, it's as solid a connection as you can get and quite frankly I've got a lot of jig heads that look just like that that have that solid hook and I've never had an issue with them. So, but it's just interesting that there are, you know, two different types and uh, you've given a very valid explanation based on your experience down here with 200 pound tarpon as to why that should play back in the Northeast with uh, a 200 pound tuna. And, and a lot of the tuna guys, the rig that I'm seeing them do is they'll put a 200 pound test split ring on the, on the solid eye yeah. and then they'll put their ball bearing swivel to that. Some of the guys like that, they like the rotation and that extra little bit of movement that that gives you, that split ring to a swivel, but it's kind of to each his own. You know, do you need that for striper fishing? If you don't need that, I'm not gonna make it fixed into the right. jig head for you if you're fishing it in a different application. But if you do, and it makes it easier to change out baits or to get that little flexibility of that ball bearing swivel when that, to eliminate line twists and what they use it for, you know, by all means, they can add that. Well, it's to one this. of the beauties of fishing is modification to a, a great sure. original design to, yeah. you know, customize it to make it a little bit more, you know, applicable to a certain kind of fishing. Yeah. Absolutely. And speaking about customization, it's my understanding <laughs> that you guys have something that's called limited batch. Limited batch. Tell it's, me a little bit about that. It's uh, one of the most successful things that we've done at NLBN. Um, we wanted to simplify the offerings to the people and have our standard colors that we need. I don't leave home without many of these colors. A chartreuse, a solid dark purple, a white, a green back. Those are staples that I always keep in my box. But then, you know, there's always situations where you might want something 
a little bit different, uh, whether it's a pink or you know Shrimp. a variation of a pink or uh, two hard contrasting colors like a chartreuse and a purple. We've kind of kept the entire palette open for us to be able to do limited batches and continuously bring new colors to market and not limit ourselves to how many colors we have sure. offered to the store. You know, it gets it you gets got your crazy basic really ones. quickly. Yeah, you've, sure. got, yeah. you've got your staple ones, but then based on demand and as the fisheries, different fisheries change because of uh, watercolor changes or salinity or a variety of factors, uh, sometimes a new color uh, can actually work where the standard colors don't work anymore. Yeah, absolutely. You want something a little bit more transparent. You want something a little bit solid colored. You want different varying colors. And it gives my partner and I uh, the flexibility to be able to experiment, play with colors that we wanted, test them out, see how they work. Okay, they work. Let's give them out to the customers. Let's make it available to the guys. So we do this twice a month. Uh, it's a monthly color. It started off as once a month. We've gone to the cadence of twice a month. We offer a, a limited batch color. It's available on our website. We typically do it every other Friday at 8 p.m. So 8 p.m. rolls around. We have thousands of people on the website <laughs> all over the country lined up That's ready to get those colors. And it's, it's a really cool way for us to bring some excitement, have something limited quantities, something that you could get your hands on. And every once in a while, the more popular ones, we do bring them back. But it just gives us, at this point, we're over a hundred different colors that we've done as wow. a company. So whereas we don't have 20, 30 colors on the shelf that you could pick from, throughout the time of the company, they've had hundreds of different colors that they could have access to through our limited batches. So it's a cool way where we can make some colors specific to the Northeast. We've made a run called Bunka. Oh. where it was a bunker pattern specifically. We've done some mackerel patterns. Um, we did one that was actually one of our most popular here and in the Northeast. It's um, our buddy Craig sent us a picture of a squid that, that you guys get a lot in the Northeast. It was red with like blue spots, iridescent purples, iridescent blues in it. It's not even a typical squid color here in Florida right. where you'll get like a white or a solid red. And we tried to mimic that color, ended up calling it Squidbilly, and it was without a doubt one of our most successful colors in Florida and in the Northeast. Wow. Um, it's a reddish hued color with blues, um, blue transparent flake in it, and for whatever reason it is in a paddle tail, so it's in a bait fish pattern, even though it's a squid color super successful. I gotta say that's awesome and that, that whole limited thing, it builds super excitement. I remember you guys actually sent me, I, it might have been this color right here, but in the small three inch paddle yes. tail. This has been out for a while, right? Sweeping beauty. So, so it was a three inch paddle tail, and um, we have the weak fish by me, sea trout for, you know, that's another name for, for other people. Right. Uh, but the weak fish bite I had by me was pretty good last year. I remember I was like, man, these little three inch paddle tails. <laughs> when I got there, I was like, automatically, I was like, weak fish. <laughs> so I went out and I smoked the weak fish on them, and I was like, yeah, these are. These are pretty good. I gave a couple of my buddies and like, you know, you know how it goes. And like, hey, yeah, you got, any more, friends. got any more of those, uh, what's the name of it? It's the um, uh, Sweeping Beauty. Got any more of those uh, Sweeping Beauties? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, nah, man, I, I got all mine, you know, <laughs> not sharing those, but it certainly creates buzz and uh, they do work. It's a great color. I could voucher myself because the weak fish loved it. Yeah. Um, Looks like a shrimp. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, whatever it looked like, they loved it. It didn't really matter. It does silly little things that just, it'll look like a, Pink, like a bubblegum pink to you but if you look we actually use this um it's a mica fine pigment but it has a little bit of a larger micron size so this goes there's all different micron sizes to get different the blue and effects the silver in that. out of That's the crazy. baits i have seen a silver and blue coming out of that pink it's exactly once you start looking at this really well under the light you'll have a blue sheen yeah. underneath the pink and one of the best ways to tell is with that tail kind of looking at that tail between you and the and the light, you could see the shades of blue that are in that tail. That's crazy. And if you look in there, there's like that micro blue. Oh, for sure. Micro yeah. pigment in there that, yeah. yeah, it looks like a pink from far out. Yeah. But then once you start looking at it, there's, there's shades of blue and sheens in there that you just can't get. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on is just doing something different. We'll take some inspiration from different colors that we've had success with from other brands, 
but always putting our twist to it to make it different. I want to hear about the beginning again. That was it's awesome to hear that story. Um. All right. Well, it it never started off as us wanting to make a fishing lure company to sell baits and make money off of it. That was never the intention at NLBN. In all reality, it was my partner and I. Um, we had a little bit of influence. We did Instagram and social media very, very early on. And we're, we're big snook guys, is what we do. We go after, that's what we did before NLBN, before making a fishing company and not being able to get to fish as often as we liked. Um, we were big snook fanatics. And when you're chasing big snooks, that is essentially your life. Just like, and this is where I respect the striped bass guys, like when you're a big striped bass fisherman, all you want is those 40, 50, it's 60 like religion. pound fish. Yeah. Everything else falls by the wayside, that's your primary focus. And if, if unfortunately, if you have a family, if you have all this stuff, <laughs> you can't really do that at the highest level because you just have to dedicate everything to it. And that's where we were, you know, five, seven, ten years ago, we were big snook fishermen. I worked to fish. That's it. And I would fish. We were out there five, six, seven nights out of the week. Every single day, it was it was our religion. We were kind of tired. And, and we had a couple sponsors, different fishing companies. But we were tired of making Frankensteins, getting plastics from the West Coast, getting jig heads from the Northeast putting together these Frankenstein baits, and then after spending all that trouble trying to source plastics and all that, not having a proper hook keeper to keep these big plastics on. Right. So one of the things that you run into is having to cast this thing, you know? Casting these jig heads that we had with just regular collars, without even catching a fish after 20, 30, 40 casts into the wind, that bait would start slipping off. Up the hook. Right. We would have to have that super glue that we were talking about earlier have to super glue the bait onto the jig head it just became very cumbersome and um we were kind of tired of it so my partner and i we we wanted to make fishing lures for ourselves catered to snook and tarpon fishing the, the first soft plastic that we ever made we've never even sold yet we kind of keep that in our back pocket a little bit of a secret you guys will find out about that later on you know when we do release it but it was strictly for us as fishermen. Um, one of the mottos that we take is we make fishing lures that we need that don't exist. And nobody catered to snook and tarpon fishing. So before we even wanted to sell a bait, what we were doing is we were making jig heads and soft plastics for our style of fishing. Heavy current, fishing off of bridges, fishing off of beaches, fishing off of jetties. Big fish. Fishing off of boats, and specifically big fish. Uh, another downfall that we ran into, like you said, big fish were the hooks. Like yeah. we use only the 2X uh, Mustad hooks or BKK hooks. This is a 4X BKK. But we started off with a 2X Mustad short shank 80, and then a long shank 2X 90. And just even in the hook itself, we tried. I have pictures when we were prototype testing everything. Every hook on the market, like. I'm not going to even say brands or types or styles, but any hook you could ever think of, whether it was a straight shank hook that we put our own eyelids in, hooks from other companies, other brands, we tried them all and we narrowed it down to these two hooks being the most well-rounded hooks, this for the 8 inch bait, this for the 5 inch bait. Um, and it wasn't until we really had this screw lock where my partner came to my house one day, he took a screw lock off of an owner beast hook and he impregnated it into the jig head he drilled a hole he glued it in there and he came to my house and he was like look at this where i was just like i looked at him and i'm like i don't even have to see it fish i already know this is a game changer in and of itself i sourced some of the springs from from a manufacturer here in the u.s and we made a round of jig heads jig heads and baits and we have a handful of the heavy hitters here in Florida, that snook and tarpon fish. And we made sure we put these in the hands <clears throat> of all the best snook and tarpon fishermen that we knew. And the overwhelming feedback that we got of how this was changing the game down here made my partner and I really take a good look at ourselves and say, you know, are we just gonna make these for ourselves or are we gonna start a brand? Yeah. 
centered around these style of baits catering to the kind of fishing that we do that we love that we cherish and that's where you know we we had a little bit of a of a reckoning where we had to come down and really say if we're going to do this we got to quit our jobs yeah. we're either all in or nothing it's the kind of way that we do things and and the way my partner and i both are it's all or nothing at the end of the day so we made the decision to I, I sold my business. I had businesses for over 10 years. He got out of his business, put a little bit of a weight, and we said, we're going all in on NLB under nothing. And we sure did. So we started off, it was about two years of the process for us to fine tune this and get what we call like the great white shark, the final version of what we're looking for, the evolution of what this started as to where it's at now. And it took us two years between the jig heads, the soft plastics, the baits, going back and forth with our original pro staffers on the tail design, the shape, the body roll that it had in the water. Every single detail, we we were never in a rush to ever sell the, the jig head to begin with. We wanted perfection first. And this evolved many different samples, prototypes, hundreds of different prototypes till we got to the final variation. but. It was, it was all centered around the fact that nobody was catering to this style of fishing that we were doing. And if you wanted to buy a snook and tarpon lure, heavy duty hooks, two ounce weights that are gonna fish, sweep an inlet 20, 30 feet deep in wind, <coughs> you just couldn't find it. Yeah. It did not exist. And um, that was the evolution of NLBN. That's why we made this is because we wanted to make fishing lures catered specifically to our style of fishing. And with all that being said and done, you know, we started off on a front porch of a house, you know, outside open air, pouring these baits, pouring the jig heads, painting all the jig heads ourselves. And we did that for the first two years of the business. Um, you know, night and day, 15 hours a day. I say the schedule, it sounds unrealistic, it's what we lived for two years, strictly. Just making sure that this got off the ground and we were putting you know, our best foot forward when it came to the paint, the quality, the materials, the plastics. We really spared no expense from the hook to the 316 stainless steel screw lock in there to the 3D eyes that we used. We really spared no expense to make the best product possible. And then pricing, everything came after that. But first was, what is it that we need to make the best bait possible? Spare no expense to do so. And then everything else, the business will follow. But first and foremost was, what is the best bait possible? What do we need as fishermen that don't exist? And we start there. And just to say something, we're not gonna just start and stop there. The motto of the business, our one of our philosophies at NLBN is we make fishing lures that we need that don't exist, period. So the second that somebody else makes something that's great and there's gonna be the next best thing, we're always looking forward to what it is that we need as fishermen. Right. We're not chasing the crowd, we're not chasing the trends, we're just focusing on what we need, where are the gaps? What do I need in my box that we don't make that I can't readily available get from anybody else? That's what we're making. That's what we're focusing on. Some interesting stuff. <coughs> it's the old baseball expression: "Build it, and they will come." Right. You know, so, yes. Uh, yes. And, and here it is: "Build it," and uh, you guys are selling a bunch of these. I mean, I got to so, say, you know, grassroots origins, passion, unique. Um, keep you guys keep developing new stuff. I mean, this stuff is. I got to say, it's impressive, man. It really is from what you guys started at as passion anglers. And, you know the. the um, the originality of it and all that is just, it's its really impressive and what you guys have now and what you're continuing to do is really cool stuff and I could tell you're, Thank you. you're genuine from talking to you. I really do, <laughs> I do, I, I respect that. It's really cool. Um, but no, it's really cool stuff and we really appreciate you uh, showing us a little bit of your, uh, your what you got going on here. Thank you. And, we're looking forward to fishing with you too. Yeah. You know, I think we'll be doing a little fishing uh, later, putting these uh, 
all these super cool baits to the test. Maybe catch a couple tarpon, some snooks, see what's, what's going to happen. But Absolutely. I'm running off of fumes right now. Like I told you guys, we went out fishing last night, did a little bit of scouting for you guys to make it easy. We found the window, a part of the tide. Took us all night to figure it out. <laughs> um, you guys are going to have to wake up really early. But um, we're going to be able to get you guys on, fishing. on some nice yep. fish. Ma made by fishermen, for fishermen, and covered in the fishermen. What's the, uh, what could be again, better than that? that? What's the slogan again? Um, the, what are you saying? We make fishing lures that we need that don't exist. You guys make fishing lures that you need that don't exist. That's, that's our focus. That's our goal. That's something to live by. That's our company motto. That's what we live by. And... Um, if you ever see us doing anything outside of that, it's it's not NLBN anymore. And that's really where I think we cut our teeth and that's where we shine against everybody else. I feel like the fishing industry, it's very trendy at the end of the day. And you could call this a trend if you like or not, you know, but this is a staple in fishing now. You have to have this in your box alongside a bunch of other lures that are very great. This is not the end all be all, but like what we were talking about earlier, and, and I'm a big proponent of use what works. I want the best fishing lure for the application that I'm fishing at now. I go outside of my own wheelhouse. There's other fishing lures that I use for that specific time. And I think that there's plenty of room for everybody, but there is a specific time, a specific place where these lures excel over anything else that you have out there. And that's where, you know, that's where most of my fishing lies. And that's why we made these because we need, we needed this fishing lure for the type of fishing that we did. We, we try to make a bass bait or, or we'll try to use a bass bait or try to make a Frankenstein off of something instead of having something specifically catered to the kind of fishing that we did. And that's where the difference, that's where you see the success of this. And you know, it's kind of crazy to believe we'd never made this in the intention of making a striped bass lure, but unintentionally, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it the way it is, unintentionally, we made even a better striped bass lure than we did a snook and tarpon lure. And when I say that, I say that for the simple purpose of your striped bass don't come up and jump six feet out of the water and head shake and head thrash. So I'm getting guys that are catching 20, 30, 40 bass on one plastic tail. Wow. And that's thanks to the screw lock being able to pin that in there. <clears throat> I love to hear that. Like, I love to hear the fact that they're getting a lot of fish out of it. Because in my world, we're just going for the bite. We just need the bite. And if I could get one, two extra bites a night, it's worth it at the end of the day. And now what I'm hearing with the striper guys, them being able to get 20, 30, 40 fish off of one plastic, you know, that's kind of music to my ears. So unintentionally, we made even a better striped bass lure than we even did a snook and tarpon lure. Match the hatch. Designed for one thing, works even better for another thing. That's when you know you have a good product. Mm -hmm. Jose, thank you, man. It's freaking great. Jose, Absolutely. what a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you, guys. And uh, we're going to be catching some tuna on these. <laughs>